Okay, so I'm going to restart again with uh, this, uh, the soil colloid again. So the characteristic, how they are stacked. So just now we look at the structure. Uh, so yeah, basically they behave very differently because of the characteristic of these two different myself. One one and two ones are two and myself. So this diagram actually shows you how the interaction may possibly exist. So you see, my cell alone, the clay alone, do not exist. They actually coexist with cations around them. Uh, not just cations, sometimes water as well. Now, let's say if you have a 1-1 one, one layer my cell, like this one. Now, this, this kind of clay actually is quite famous. It's called kaolinite. Now, kaolinite is actually called uh, China clay. China clay, because why? Because this kind of clay, is white in color, very bright, looks very clean. And this clay actually is used to make a lot of porcelain. Your, uh, your teapots, the cups. So those white color cups, that they come from here. Now, if you look carefully at the structure itself, they have plenty of hydrogen bond. And if you throw this clay into any liquid water, in any water, they will not going to dissolve at all. They just stay just like that. And this kind of clay, because of the presence of the hydrogen bond, prevent them from splitting. They don't split, they just sit very tight, even though with water. Because of the presence of hydrogen bond. Now, if you look at the side, there's another system, 2-1 two one, two one layer, 2-1 uh, layer micelle. Now, in this case, this kind of micelle, they are attached closely with the presence of cation. Now, in this case, the cation will be potassium. Now, to say this potassium is not like a cation with two plus charge, but they exist over there. Now, the presence of this cation, single charge cation, will not going to have the same effect as kaolina over here with hydrogen bond. Now, they are very strongly tied together because of the large amount of hydrogen bond. Now, this one, potassium may exist. They will just only neutralize the negative charge. You see, if they are presence of potassium, they manage to neutralize the charge and therefore they can come close together. Yeah. So when these come close together, then they will not going to swell again. However, when water comes in, for example, when water comes in, it's going to be like the one below here. See at the bottom, bottom right, uh, bottom right hand side, Mont Morillonite. This is usually the, the common clay that we see outside the red colored ones these are the ones and why they are so significant here because when water comes in you can you can imagine like this is before water comes in this is after water comes in so water in this case washes away the cation be it potassium be it calcium it will do the same job yeah now once this cation are removed then they were going to have the negative charge again and guess what they repel one more time so you can see like E light here can be said to be before hydration. The one in Montmorillonite is after hydration. So Montmorillonite does not exist as depicted right here. <clears throat> in fact, the natural Montmorillonite, if they're in solid form, they also will have a lot of cations in between them. Like, it, like, like, like you can see right here, it could be potassium, it could be calcium, it could be anything. Any cations will do. Yeah. So this is the difference between 1-1 one, one layer and 2-1 layer. While kaolinite cannot be swelled by water, in other words, it's a non-swelling clay, this one swells. And of course, I think you can guess the name already. These two is called swelling clays. Yeah. Now, in some cases, in some cases, there are other 2-1 layer that do not swell. For instance, chloride. So this chloride has no chlorine. And strangely, the chlorine itself in probably might go to mislead you. They have chlorine, but no, they don't have chlorine. But what, what's special about this uh, this kind of clay is that even though they are two one layer, between them they have aluminium or probably magnesium. But the point here is not magnesium; it's more of aluminium. You see, these two cations have more than one plus charge. Magnesium two plus, aluminium three plus. And when they form cations, these two cations can be extremely small. 
How small? Well, small enough can be comparable to those in Kauli, the Kauli net here. So you can imagine that the situation that you can see right here, the presence of aluminium and magnesium, we're going to neutralize the charge from both sides. And this aluminium and magnesium seems to be the, the peacemaker, I would say. Now, if you say two, these two one layer, they repel because they have negative negative charge, these two neutralize it and bring them, bring them close together. You can imagine that this aluminium magnesium is similar to this hydrogen bond. Yeah. So that's why this one is non-swelling. Even though it's in two one layer, it's non-swelling because of the strong interaction between the micelle. Now obviously you can have another one, vermiculite. Now in this case, vermiculite, they have magnesium surrounded by water. Now, of course, this one, I think you can guess it, it swells. Because why? Magnesium surrounded by water is very much the same like this one yeah so the difference between these two is that some can swell some cannot swell and because of that these two clay have very very different application one that people use for structure if you want to say it, structure for construction because they don't swell anything can swell that uh, will be carried away due to uh, uh, what do you call it? erosion? Anything can swell is very high risk in terms of the erosion. Yeah. So that's why kaolina usually they can be used as part of the construction material. The other two don't look at them as something bad because why? If you compare the amount of negative charge of two one layer. I mean, by the number of negative charge, you already know that they have far more cation exchange capacity. So you can tell. I mean, two one clays they are useful simply because they can store cat, uh, they can store a lot of cations, and therefore they can store a lot of nutrient, and that perhaps is very good. And there's one more. Now, this negative charge not only they can trap nutrients, they also can trap. Heavy metals, heavy metals that coincide coincidentally also two plus charge, like cadmium, cadmium two plus, um, mercury also two plus. Although mercury sometimes can be organic, but I think you get the idea. Yeah, this negative charge, they are having very very special and very important function in the environment. Now this table actually summarizes whatever they have explained to you earlier why some 2-1 and 1-1 layer micelles have such and such characteristic because they also depends on what are the cations or what are the interactions that comes between them and that also dictates whether they can swell or not now oxide clays uh sesquio sesqui oxides also known as sesqui oxides now this one between them they have uh, iron oxide so this one do they swell now is this over here do not form crystalline say they do not swell yeah so they do not swell because they coincidentally they have all these iron oxides and aluminium oxides i i believe i believe it looks something probably like this that one yeah Probably, probably, but I don't think it's only aluminium and magnesium. Probably is or some some oxygen in between here, but they also carry some positive charge. Yeah, so this is very similar to the E light that you saw just now. Now this one humus. Uh, so this is exactly what you can see humus, or in other words, humic acid. And in fact, this is exactly the structure of humic acid. This is just one part of humic acid. It could be bigger, it could be smaller, but you get the idea. They have a lot of. Uh, benzene ring and near to this benzene ring a lot of hydroxyl group hydroxyl sorry hydroxyl at the bottom on top of it is carboxylic acid group i'm um, just only referring to this part i mentioned you have other parts as well so you can see how many negative charge we have we have many yeah okay now humus particles are residue of organic matter that you have to remember humus is organic source it's not mineral they don't have the octahedral they don't have the tetrahedral structure but they are from organic they are carbon majority. Okay, they are not crystalline and form irregular round shape. How irregular? How round shape? Um, can't really tell because they can like berpintal. They call it. They can. 
they can tweak, they can form tweaks, they can spin and spin out of random direction. It's not like your phone cord where they spin on one direction, but this one, any direction. I think the best way I can uh, put an analogy to this is like what you can see in the sponge. Uh, the main type of sponge. Yeah, I think this is what I can, I can tell you right now. Now they spin and they form kings. And because of that, they will form usually a round shape. This irregular round shape is not a perfect round shape, a sphere. No, it is not. It's irregular. Now, what's so special about this one? Apart from having this negative charge, they also form a lot of pores because when they twist, when they twist and turn and form kings between it, and even though they form a round shape, inside that round shape, it's actually hollow. Because what? They twist. They don't compress very closely. And because of that, usually humors is actually more preferred if we, the farmers, want to increase the CEC in the soil. Farmers, if they want to increase cation exchange capacity, they don't add more clay. Instead, they add more humus, or simply saying like they add more organic matter. Yeah. So just an introduction to you. If you forgot what are the names of this so-called functional group, well, this is a good time for you, for you to recap what you've learned in organic chemistry. So being first, carboxyl group or carboxylic acid group is what you can see right here. One carbon, two oxygen with one hydrogen uh, right here. Now the next group, I'm not sure whether you've seen it before, but this is extremely important. It's a hydroxyl group attached directly to a benzene ring. Now, why this is so important? But first of all, the name. Let's get the name correct. If you can see one hydroxyl group directly attached to a hexagon, a benzene ring, we have a name for this hydroxyl. We don't call it hydroxyl, we call it phenolic hydroxyl. Or, in other words, yeah, phenolic hydroxyl. It's not phenol, but phenolic hydroxyl. Now, this hydroxyl is not like the normal hydroxyl because this one can form oxygen minus, uh, sorry, not oxygen minus, no, 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 yeah, the negative charge. This hydrogen can dissociate. They can leave this oxygen very easily. Why? Because of this hexagon, this, this benzene ring right here. Okay, I think I'll stop here because if you want to explain further, that will go into organic chemistry. Just remember, if you can see this hydroxyl attached to benzene ring, they can easily form O minus. That's all you need to know. Yeah. The other hydroxyl is the normal hydroxyl that you lay in organic chemistry. OH attached to aliphatic group. Oh, so this is the saturated carbon, as you can see right here. Now, this one is not like this one. Yeah. This alcoholic or aliphatic hydroxyl group does not easily dissociate. They will stay like this. They will stay like this and it's quite stable. Only under very extreme condition, this hydrogen may leave, but normal condition, they don't. Yeah. Now, the other one is also aliphatic, not aliphatic, phenolic hydroxyl group. They also can accept a uh, proton or H, but this one also does not happen so readily. This one is, yeah. Now, each of these functional groups can undergo dissociation where the H, the H will leave this respective functional group and becomes H+. Plus. Now you might think that they become acidic. Well, no, because why? Uh, because the soil actually can, uh, this H plus can easily neutralized by the negative charge on the soil or the clay. Now, what's important here is that once they have dissociation, this functional group all will carry a negative charge. You see? This is before reaction. This is after reaction. The left hand side is before, before some reaction. The right hand side is after a certain reaction. Now my question is, do you know what is the name of the reaction? So you can put an arrow down here. To convert this into this, the right hand side. Do you know what is the name? Or you want me to break you the answer? Let me you know. Okay, to the count of three, I assume that you don't know the answer. Okay, now I'm going to tell you. Right. Usually, in order to convert all this functional group into negative charge, all you need to do is increase the pH. 
yeah, increase the pH, make it slightly alkaline, make it more alkaline, it will become this condition. So in other words, you can call neutralization if you like. Uh, you can also call it dissociation because anyway, it is dissociation. H plus is dissociated. So this is exactly what happened. And because of that, what I want to say here is actually CEC is not something permanent. It may change. It may change with the pH of the soil. Yeah. So don't think that anything that is considered high CEC will stay like that forever because if the pH decrease, if the pH becomes acidic, if the condition of soil becomes acidic, they may lose, the soil may lose all the CEC value. Yeah. Okay. So far, so far so good. Any problem? Anyone facing problem? Oh yeah, somebody want to get back in. Oh, okay, I just accepted it. I think you probably missed a big part that I have explained to you earlier. Okay, yeah. So we shall continue like that. Any questions so far regarding the what? Okay, so no question. Then I'll just continue that. So that we saw call like. Now, soil and charged colloid. So earlier, I managed to find one video uh, depicting, yeah, depict, I mean, this video, we're going to show you how isomorphic substitution happened. Now, actually, I have experience teaching students isomorphic substitution, and these students are supposed to be very good students, and even they, even they themselves also find it very hard to imagine how isomorphic substitution is so what i can tell you is that you have a video link click on it later and then watch that video and see how the charge can change due to this substitution we call it isomorphic substitution yeah now actually this slide actually tells you how does a clay can form a negative charge so earlier you saw just now the tetrahedral sheet or the one that you have the tetrahedral layer, the silica, the silica layer earlier. These are the layers that gives you the negative charge. However, in some circumstances, uh, there might be some changes, some changes of elements. And because of the change of elements, some parts of the clay, of this clay, might gain an excess negative charge or lose what excess negative charge due to this what is so-called isomorphous substitution. Now, this is not really a big deal for me because why I do not believe that this is a major reaction that happens in the soil. Because why? Minerals like clay, they are very stable in the soil. These kind of substitution, frankly speaking, do not happen easily, but they can. So I let you watch the video and then probably in our next lesson, maybe you can come back and tell me. If you don't understand, then I'll probably use that video and explain to you one more time. Yeah. Now, another case, now this is exactly what I told you earlier. How does the humus can gain the negative charge? You see, I told you earlier that you increase the pH and this is exactly what happened. This hydroxyl group reacts with a hydroxide and guess where this is coming from? Yes, it comes from any alkaline material or any alkaline solution. And by adding this one, essentially you're increasing the pH. And guess what? Neutralization will happen. And this will going to interact, react, neutralization, as you know, produce water. So this is your water. And in the end, what happened to the surface? The surface of this colloid or clay micelle will gain this negative charge. So this negative charge actually is nearer to the surface. Huh? The surface of this clay gained the negative charge which is consistent like, to what I told you just now on how to convert a neutral humus into negative charge humus, increase the pH. So these are the examples of uh, what are the negative charge that you can possibly gain from these different kind of clays, which I think I already explained to you. 
So this is just a recap. Like, you can just read it yourself later on. And we're moving on to the, uh, the most important reaction. If not for soil, maybe if not for, or for environment, maybe for soil. Soil itself, when we talk about the interaction in the soil, um, mostly they are due to this cation exchange. Of course, what is being exchanged here? Well, the ions. Now, this ion can be positive charge. If it's positive, it's cation. If it's negative charge, it's an ion. The examples, as you can see right there. Now, how this happened? Now, imagine that on top of here is before the reaction. After the reaction, whoop, you can see they change its place, isn't it? Now, any smart student, we're going to see some mistake over here. Not really a mistake, like maybe some improvement. So the improvement is that, well, let, before the improvement, what's the problem of this one? You can clearly see that the equation, if you may want to call it, the equation is not balanced. So yeah, it's right here. You should add three over here. Yeah, lah, because why you cannot get three hydro, you, you cannot get had, had three H plus from one H plus through that. So they have to be equal. This is three H plus. Yeah. And because of this three H plus, this surface here must be three minus through that. Yeah, there's a three minus charge over here. Because otherwise, you cannot neutralize this entire three minus, uh, this three plus charge for aluminium. So it's as simple as that. You lose three H plus and you gain one three plus. And what makes this possible is the charge. Now, in order to have like cation exchange reaction to happen, the charge have to be like the same before and after. Yeah. So in order to balance this charge is three plus uh, three H plus over here. Now again, the cation exchange also, I attach a video. Now this video, I think, is more than cation exchange reaction. You can actually explore other things. Now. In which, this video, if not mistaken, tells you like what happened to the roots, how does the root uh, absorb nutrient, and in fact, one of the ways nutrient can be absorbed into the root of plants is by cation exchange. But there are more than that. Take your time and read it. And I think I don't want to explain what this is because I think they are, <coughs> they were explained earlier. So I'll skip this one. Okay, let me see. Yeah, give me a minute. Let me see if there's anything I can tell you because I think uh, a lot of the points in this slide, they're actually repetitive. They keep on repeating the same thing again, again, and again. I think this is also the same thing. Lah, because what? This one explained to you how H plus originally in the clay myself uh, being disposed, released, whereas what, what K plus actually comes back in, similar to CA plus. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same with what I explained to you earlier. So I guess I will just skip. Oh, by the way, before that, before I skip, you notice that this thing over here, NO3 minus, yes, it's nitric ion. You see, this is a problem. And one of the reasons why nitrogen is so difficult to be absorbed by plants is because when they, whenever they are in atmosphere, nitrogen, when they're exposed to, uh, to, to air, the oxygen in the air, usually they become oxidized and they become nitrate. So even though the ammonia you put in the soil, eventually they become nitrate. And then when they dissolve in water, they cannot stick to the clay. Why? Negative charge and negative charge. That's why, that's why usually nitrate, yeah, when you put into soil, very easily and very quickly, they will be lost. Either they're being, they will be lost in the form of ammonia gas away into the atmosphere, or maybe they just lost due to uh, weathering. I mean, runoff. When they wash this, they just follow the direction of the water, they dissolve it, yeah, and they cannot stick to the clay myself. So here we have like cation exchange capacity. See, see, now this is actually a soil parameter. This is not a reaction. This is like a measurement, just like pH, EC. This is a measurement of a soil quality. And by measuring this one, you're essentially measuring how much of a negative charge a soil sample have. And from there, you actually can have a prediction of how much of a positive cations how much of positive charge that uh, this soil can attract. Because the more negative charge, the more cations you can attract. 
and hence cation exchange capacity is usually used to hint or to define a fertility of a soil. But before that, the hard part here is that we need to calculate. Now, how do you know which soil have higher CEC, which one is lower? You will need to undergo a certain experiment. And in fact, if not mistaken, US EPA have around three to four, three to four methods on how to uh, determine CEC at our exchange capacity. Now, the one that you are supposed to do earlier, earlier in the, in the lesson plan, experiment number 10. Experiment number 10 is actually one of the famous, uh, the easiest way to determine CEC. And in this case, there's another name for it, we call it uh, ammonium, sorry, not ammonium, sodium acetate, sodium acetate method. Sodium acetate method is the common name given to that method developed by US EPA to determine CEC. Now, why they're so easy? Because instead of like analyzing every cation, every single cation that you can extract from the soil, in that method, they will just replace every cation with sodium and they just measure how much sodium in the extract. And based on that, they just calculate lah, how much of negative charge. Now this way is much more easier simply because if you manage to replace all those various cations with sodium, remember how many charges is one sodium? Just one plus, isn't it? I see. For every single sodium that you can detect, that indicates one negative charge. It's as easy as that. Yeah. So just to bring you to just to take you through like the sodium acetic method the first step is they're going to leach they're going to wash the soil remove all the cations then after that they replace with sodium and that sodium is sodium acetate so they soak with sodium acetate hopefully the sodium will going to attach to the soil to each of the negative charge and then after that they're going to extract they're going to wash out all those uh, adsorbed uh, sodium and then they measure using an instrument now this instrument could be so many but they can give you a concentration. So based on the concentration of sodium that you can extract, then you calculate which one? Ah, this one, the third point. The third point in the slide. Now, the concentration that you usually get from instrument, for example, ICPOES or ICPMS, the unit that you get is usually milligram per liter. Milligram of sodium per liter of sample. And from there, you can slowly convert and calculate into centimole per kg. And in fact, in fact, um, most of the soil scientists, although some may differ, most of the soil scientists, they actually prefer SI unit. In fact, these two, they are universally accepted. It depends on what scientists you're talking about. If that scientist is more of agriculture for example agriculture would usually use the other one nearly equivalent gram uh, per 100 gram of sample uh, per 100 gram of soil sample now there is a reason why agronomists agronomists or agriculture people they use the first unit instead of second because from here they also can know what are the other cations it's not just sodium they also want to know how much of potassium, how much of calcium, how much of magnesium, and all will be converted equivalently. But rest, rest assured, whatever that is measured in centimole per kg unit is actually equivalent to this one as well. Yeah? Because essentially, CEC is the measure of negative charge, not, cal, not, not cations, actually. I hear a lot of beeping sound outside. Does anybody want to come back in? Yeah, nobody admit them. So, anybody else? Okay, I think everybody should be here already. Okay, I'll get back in. Okay. okay, so the definition of cation exchange capacity. CEC of the soil is normally expressed in milligram equivalent per 100 gram of soil. So milligram equivalent. So this equivalent, they are like so subjective. Right? You don't know what is that equivalent. So I think the next slide will tell you that. Ah, this slide. But I have to say this slide also have one mistake just not sure whether you notice or not okay now this one very similar to the mole concept 
the more concept that you learn in secondary school. One gram of hydrogen. Now, divide by the atomic mass of hydrogen also happens to be one. Then you have one mole. So if you have one gram of hydrogen, meaning that you also have one mole, uh, one mole of hydrogen. And yeah, no more Avogadro and Avogadro's number. And you also have the, this much of atoms inside here. Now, this will represent also, you have to have one mole of negative charge. See? Now, if you want to compare with calcium, that is a different story. Because calcium is different in two ways. Or compared to hydrogen, they, differ, they, they, they are different in two ways. Number one, calcium is heavier. And in fact, the weight of calcium, the atomic mass of calcium is actually 40 grams per mole. Of course, they are not the same, isn't it? Okay, now that is not the only difference. Let's not forget, calcium usually form 2 plus charge. So you want to say equivalent to this one, of course, they are not equivalent. Okay? So in this case, if you want to compare the equivalent, if you're using calcium, then you have to divide by two, and then, of course, the Avogadro's number is actually half. It's actually half of hydrogen, because what? Calcium is two plus charge. So you see, it's actually quite complicated to calculate milli equivalent per 100 gram unit, because, yeah, I found it also quite quite troublesome to find it. Okay, now, if you want to compare again with uh, potassium, now this one, similarly with uh, hydrogen, potassium also have one plus charge, so yeah. But in order to get milli equivalent with hydrogen, you're going to need 39 grams of potassium. So you see, the value is no longer the same. Earlier is one gram, then you have one milli equivalent again. But if you have potassium unit, then it will be a different story. But here's the thing now. If you're confused with whatever that I told you earlier between calcium and potassium, actually, they are very simple. You just have to remember that whatever that you calculate under this unit, you just have to make sure that they are measuring with the negative charge. So no matter what you do, they are having the same negative charge. Let's say if you want to back calculate, if you're given the concentration of calcium and you want to back calculate mean equivalent, then you calculate accordingly based on the number of charges you can attract. Okay? So there are plenty of like uh, for uh, 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 equation, equation or formula that you can use to calculate. So these are the equation. By the way, I would rather go straight to this one. I think this one probably can tell you a much more better story. Lah. How actually do they compare between different elements and also the milli equivalent weight? So they are different, isn't it? And they are different based on these two factors. Number one, the atomic weight. And number two is the valency. Valency means how many plus charges they can form. And because of that, they come up with very different milli equivalent weight. And this table probably will give you some more example to see whether it makes sense or not. How do you calculate this and that? And yeah, these are the calculation. Now you can also further convert milli equivalent to ppm. Now ppm also is an SI unit. Ppm is milligram per liter or some sort of milligram per kg. There are so many ways that you can actually calculate CEC and also things like that. Now you might be asking me. If I want to give you a question, which one do you come up? I think you probably can find out the answer. Because for those students who actually investigate past year exam question, this is never appear. This one never appear in final exam question. Now, not because I, I'm against this one. It's actually quite important for you guys to learn because eventually I'm not sure you're going to like work in the agricultural sector or not because every single people who work in agriculture or agronomy must know how to calculate this one in milli equivalent per 100 gram. However, if you work in any analytical lab, chemistry lab, usually we use this one. It's SI unit. It's SI unit which uses one centimole per kg because I can tell you straight away, much more easier to calculate. 
and much more easier to compare. You're comparing apple with apple, less stress, I would say. Yeah. And I myself being a chemist, of course, now you know which one I prefer as I unit sensitive per kg. And in fact, that is one of the reasons why I choose experiment 10 for you. Okay, so quite a lot of trouble. But I think uh, before I leave this section, there's one thing that I want to show you. Now, this one, this slide shows you how to calculate CEC in uh, by an agronomist, I would say. Now, comparing to uh, compared to the experiment 10, the sodium acetic method that you are supposed to do, agronomists or the scientists from the agriculture sector, they usually don't do that. How do they determine CEC? Simple. You take the soil sample and you extract all the cations from the soil. So you wash up, wash using ammonia acid. Usually ammonia acetate is the one that they mix. So they extract all the cations from ammonium acetate and each of them, they determine the concentration. And these are usually the concentration unit that you're going to see like PPM. PPM means milligram per liter. And that's exactly the, the result that you normally see from ICP OES. So these are the results. Once you get the result, how do you, con how do you convert into a mini equivalent per gram? So each of them, you divide by its atomic weight. And then after that, you come up with this and you plus, I mean, you, you sum them all together. And this is where you get it. Now, it looks quite easy, it, it, isn't it? But um, well, it can, be, it, it can be easy once you know what to divide, isn't it? Now, these are actually the factors that already predetermined. And in fact, if you want to know this one, I think you also can know what are the factors, isn't it? Like 20, 20 uh, 230. These are the factors that I predetermined and you can divide straight away uh, by using the results uh, straight from the ICP. Divide by this factor and you get the result. Sum them up and you get uh, the CEC value in milli equivalent per kg. Now, the question is, why do they want to do it? Like I told you just now, this is so tedious, guys. You have to like repeat four more times, some, 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 and then you have, you have exposed yourself to so many mistakes. But why? Why agronomists want to do it? Now, let's not forget, agronomists, they look at the soil nutrient. And earlier we learned, in soil nutrient, we have 16 of them, one, six. So each of them, they are important. That's why they want to know how much of each of these nutrients. Because agronomists, they want to alter, they want to adjust the nutrient in the soil. If, let's say, the soil has less of a nutrient, then they probably can put a specialized fertilizer to address that problem. So that is why agronomists, they want to know all the cations, not just sodium. Okay? Because this is the important information that they need to know. Ah, so I, I hear a lot of beeps. So who is stuck? Why are you all like keep logging out and come back in? Okay. So now percent saturation percent base that percent base saturation is actually to calculate how much or how many percent of uh, uh, how many percent of these cations that are present in the extract. And in other words, these are actually the important information agronomists want to know because these will indicate um, a prevalence or, or a concentration of the elements that they have in the soil. And this is where they can address the fertility, the fertility of the soil. Okay, now, it's already another half an hour. Shall we like take a five minute break? Anyone? Yes or no? Five minute break? Five minute break while I answer the question. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. Now, while well, this five minute break, you can take a five minute break while I look at the question and try to answer it. Okay. Sakina asks, you increase the pH means add limestone to the soil, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, not just limestone. It could be dolomite yesterday. Uh, yeah, two days ago, we learned about dolomite and GML. That also what? Anything. Anything that can increase the pH, but usually it's limestone. Yeah, usually. 
Next question is maybe they have problem with internet connection. Oh yeah, those guys. Yeah, why are they long up? But I, I cannot blame them because just now when I start recording, when I start recording, someone was logged out for some for whatever reason I don't know. But anyway, I think I'll stop recording one more time.